When it comes to government secrets, and especially those about UFOs, the Black Vault primarily focuses on the American government and their connection to one of the biggest mysteries of our time. But what about other countries? Let's say, like Australia. This briefing paper that was uh, created and shared. My guest today is Grant Levac and he used the Australian Freedom of Information Act to access records about UFOs and UAP. But what really is going on down under? Why is Australia not taking this subject seriously when our US ally is? Grant is about to step into the vault to tell us all. Stay tuned. You're about to journey inside the Black Vault. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your live stream or your podcast of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., owner and founder and creator of theblackvault.com. And I'm uh, pretty excited about this show because I've wanted to do it for a while. As most of you know, most of you watch this channel, you know, I talk about the American government and their connection to UFOs and UAP all the time. Uh, it is one of my personal fascinations, even though I deal with pretty much every government secret in the book. But I don't really deal with a whole lot of other countries, but I get that question a lot. And my guest today, Grant Levac, thank you, Grant, for joining me all the way from Australia. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, you're very welcome. Look, I, I appreciate you giving me some of your time late in the day. I'm, uh, it's my morning here. So greetings from the future. Uh, disclosure hasn't happened yet, but uh you never know what will what happen by end of day. But no, it's great to be with you. I appreciate you uh, you inviting me on. Absolutely. If disclosure does ever happen, give me a call first. That way <laughs> I can be the psychic in America to predict that it happens. So thank you for that. Uh, but Easy for enough. those those who are watching, if you haven't figured it out, uh, Grant, being from Australia, we're going to talk about uh, the Australian government, what their connection is or isn't to UAP and UFOs. And the reason, uh, Grant, and to the audience as well, why I love these types of interviews is to be blatantly honest with you, I am 100% ignorant about what we are going to be talking about. And and I, I really, I've seen your posts, which is why I reached out to you. We've been friends beyond that. But I saw your post because you have looked into the Australian government and again, their connection to this. So before we get into that, give the audience a little bit of background about who Grant is and uh, how you got into researching the Australian government's connection to UFOs. Yeah, so I mean, I, I always have kind of positioned myself as just a, an ordinary bloke that kind of believes in extraordinary things with a, a healthy degree of skepticism and, and an open mind thrown in there together for good measure. And I've been um, fascinated by this topic ever since I was, I was a young kid. I'm 43 years of age now, so growing up as a young boy in the 80s, um, my, my dad, when I was about eight or nine years of age, took me to a, a photo exhibition, which was a UFO photo exhibition. And I'd never been to any photo exhibition before. And I was just completely mesmerized by these big black and white blow ups of, uh, of famous sightings uh, throughout the exhibition. And one of the photos was the McMinnville photo from the 50s. And I remember just staring at that photo for what felt like a good 10, 15 minutes, just losing myself in, in what it would have been like to take that photo, be on that, you know, that farm, that ranch's farm and, and see with both fascination and terror what, what would be in front of you. So that was kind of what, um, intrigued me from a young age. And then growing up as a teenager, obviously, you know, every Wednesday night at 9 p.m., I'd be watching the X-Files and, and reading books and watching, watching shows on, uh, on, on documentaries growing up. But it, it really wasn't until 2017, like for, I guess, a lot of people, when the, the New York Times articles came out, um, that, that really piqued my interest and kind of reinvigor reinvigorated my, my appetite for it. Uh, so my interest has kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit over the years. And, and I actually have to thank you um, directly, John, because when COVID started, um, I 
was introduced to Spotify by a friend of mine and I somehow ended up on uh, listening to Jimmy Church and I was listening quite regularly and, and you were one of the guests. Uh, and so listening to you speak about you know, your uh, history and experience with trying to hold government to account and transparent and, and going through the FOIA process, that really got me quite interested in, well, this is a way in which we can engage uh, people that we elect into positions of authority and we have a right to information. So, uh, you know, it's important that we be privy to that information. So that was really the starting piece for me. And, and then I kind of found UCR, I think, uh, and listened quite frequently to Luis Rather and, and Michael Madaluni before he departed now UFO Jane. Uh, and so ever since, you know, COVID started, I've been really just soaking it all up and being a sponge uh, on this topic. So I've, I've tried to throw myself into it as much as I can and, and you know, not just the FOIA aspect as a result of um, the good work that you've been doing. So I'm really just standing on the shoulders of giants like yourself, some great Australian researchers, Keith Basterfield, Bill Chalker, Paul Dean, Ross Coulthard, these guys, I'm just really learning from them and, and learning from what you do through your discovery efforts uh, to, to try and engage my elected representatives here in Australia and, and following the, the effort that, um, you know, Luis Jimenez at UCR spearheaded with the big phone home, I had never engaged my elected representatives before, you know, really this year or late last year. So it was, uh, through the, the efforts of the big phone home and the work that you do that I've really, uh, got off my ass and thrown myself into the game rather than watching from the sidelines. Well, I appreciate that. And, and you've obviously have done that work. And, and that's, that's why I wanted to reach out to you for this interview is because I have such appreciation for people that instead of sitting on the sidelines, stand up and, and start doing something. And you've definitely done that. And you've utilized the Australian version. I think they call it the Freedom of Information Act. Also, there are some countries that have variations of the same name, but similar concept. But for those who don't know, uh, give them a rundown of the Australian version of the Freedom of Information Act. And what is it that you can can access? Is it, is it identical to the American law? Or is it a little bit different? Yeah, it's 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 actually very comparable to FOIA in the US. So uh, they typically refer to it as just FOI in Australia, uh, even though it's the Freedom of Information Act, uh, FOI so just and FOI, FOI, yeah, so, FOI. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and it pretty much you know having a right to information, you can request uh, for for documents. Uh, obviously, obviously anything that's classified or pr privacy information, they'll redact. Uh, with you know certain redaction classifications that you can look up via the the act itself, uh, but the nice thing I guess for me anyway, when lodging a, a, a FOIA request in Australia is the the statutory deadline for response is typically thirty days, <laughs> whereas I know in the states uh, you've got you know upwards of what six to nine years in some instances. So there's a massive backlog issue in the US. Uh, we don't have that that same challenge here in Australia. And you can actually look at uh, when you receive a FOIA uh, decision and and documents from the um, you know the Australian government. Um, you can identify by the number that, that that they designate to the FOIA. It just works on a counter system, and so there's significantly less requests that are being submitted to government here in Australia than than obviously in the US. So uh, it's a much more timely process at the moment, thankfully. <laughs> So with uh, before we get into specifically the, the UAP issue, overall with secrecy and the Australian government and, and military, when you use, uh, the, I was making the joke with the FOI instead of FOIA, but the Freedom of Information uh, Act, when you, when you utilize that in Australia, what is the consensus to the researcher? Is it I'm up for a battle like it is here in the States, because every time I file one, I'm just, you know, armoring up and, you know, getting my weapons ready because I know it's going to be a hardship. Is the Australian government as secretive as as the American government? Well, personally, I haven't come up against. Uh, I mean, I've only had success on a small number of, of FOIA requests, uh, and the redactions that have been included are typically privacy information or or information that's irrelevant to the initial request. Um, so, I haven't come a cup up against any uh, you know any specific pushback um, on on any requests that I've received. Uh, 
I, I do know that the responses that you often get from government, and that's just not FOIA alone, but also when members of parliament or Australian senators here uh, submit a question on notice for for people in positions of leadership, particularly Australian defence, uh, the responses that come back are incredibly pithy. They're, they're very short and succinct. They, as I suspect, which is comparable with the US government, they'll only tell you the absolute bare minimum that addresses your request. Uh, they won't volunteer any information above and beyond the, the scope of your inquiry. So that is... Um, yeah, that, that's both a blessing and a curse. I mean, one of the great things I think about FOIA, and this is really really why I, I, I respect uh, and value the service that you offer, not just for, for, for your own personal curiosity, but those of us that are, uh, you know, members of this community, is that um, FOIA is just one important piece of the puzzle. And, uh, you know, we've only got a few corner pieces of this 10,000-piece puzzle and we've probably got pieces of multiple puzzles. Uh, and, you know, when you receive a, a FOIA response with documents, there are often those little breadcrumbs in the FOIA, which then will lead you to submitting one or two other FOIA requests. And case in point, if you hadn't submitted a FOIA request for the classified version of uh, ODNI's preliminary, preliminary assessment, we probably wouldn't have known about the redactions pertaining to those common shapes. So... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important that there are folks like you and others that recognize that they have a right to information and they want to and need to know that information and they take it upon themselves to uh, invest the time, energy and effort to submit these requests because they often do reveal other breadcrumbs that form part of a much larger loaf of bread over time. So uh, when you look at the totality of all of the indirect evidence, the anecdotal evidence, the information that we're provided from government, you then start to have a picture as to, well, what potentially is going on? I mean, everyone can speculate as to what exactly UAP are, but, um, you know, FOIA, I think, is an incredibly valuable part of the equation. It, it definitely is. It gets a bad rap, at least here in America, in some circles, because it never produces exactly what we want but it does offer those those glimpses you use the 10,000 piece puzzle analogy and and I love the puzzle analogy the way that I uh kind of frame it on my end is that you have that 10,000 piece puzzle and you start putting it together and you realize that's just a 10,000 piece to another puzzle yep. you know even bigger yeah. and it keeps branching out but FOIA does offer those 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 glimpses um I want to take you back to 2017 when you were uh, saying that you were getting into it. I know that, that that those stories created worldwide buzz. But in Australia, was it this, the same countrywide, if that makes sense? So like in America, I mean, it was just explosive, you know, from mm. December 2017 into the beginning of 2018. There were stories every eight seconds here and 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 it was explosive. In Australia, was it the same or was it hey, look at these crazy Americans. They're looking at U UFOs. Yeah, unfortunately, it was the, the latter. I mean, with the exception <laughs> of the crazy part, I think um, th there has always been, um, historically, Australia has always followed the US's lead on, on important topics that evolve over time. But Australia has been very, very slow on the uptake, and particularly the Australian media. It was only uh, really as a result of the really good work that, that Ross, Ross Coulthard's doing with uh, not only his, his book In Plain Sight, but the number of documentaries that he's done on the seven spotlight, spotlight program that he, he produces, uh, that the Australian media started to take notice. And so now you have uh, nationally, uh, you know, national uh, channels with national reach like sunrise program which i think you've probably been on once or twice yourself i have yeah uh, you know there's the the today show there's uh the project all these various kind of news and current affairs type uh shows as well as your breakfast shows they're starting to actually uh take the topic seriously and report on it when something important happens in the u.s so like when the you know the the um the public congressional hearing happened back in may uh, that you know hit the uh, hit the the, the TV uh, airways down here under, and and often they'll invite folks like Jeremy Corbell to to come on and talk about it because he has 
he's well recognized in the community and, and for thought leadership, much like yourself and so on. So the one frustration that I have with the Australian media and, and credit to them that they're now starting to cover this topic more seriously is that there are still elements that whenever they do a story or they cover it, they always throw on the X-Files theme at the front of it. And it yeah. really just kind of gets right under my skin. I mean, because we're past that, you know, this is now uh, we're at a point where it really needs to be taken incredibly seriously because U.S. lawmakers and the U.S. Department of Defense is taking it incredibly seriously. And, and that's the, the big uh, driving factor for me is, well, why isn't Australia taking it seriously when our U.S. ally and Five Eyes partner is? And that's not just the Australian Department of Defense, but also the Australian media. You know, they're not exercising their journalistic due diligence and asking these important questions of, uh, Australian leadership. You know, why isn't Australia looking at this issue uh, more closely? Because our Five Eyes partner is. So they're the frustrations that I kind of have with the Australian media, but I do give them credit that they are starting to cover this somewhat more seriously than they have in the past and give it more um, more breathing time than, than they have had before. And you kind of lead me to my, led me to my next question, and that is, aside from the media, is the Australian government taking this seriously? And it sounds like the answer is no, but can you elaborate on that? What, what, are, what are they doing, if anything at all? So, well, that's probably a good starting point. If we, if we dial the clock back to uh, the 27th of October of last year, and I've, I've got um, a video I can show your audience. There sure. is, so following the release of the, the ODNI's preliminary assessment on, on UAP on the 25th of June of, of last year, um, on, on a regular cadence, a couple of times a year, the Australian government there, they have what is called a, a Senate estimates hearing where they talk about, um, government, government spending, uh, on various programs. You know, uh, is the government spending it wisely? You know, are they, are we, are we utilizing taxpayer dollars efficiently and effectively? And so at that Senate estimates meeting, Senator Peter Wish Wilson, who's a member of the Greens party, who's recently been reelected, he was the, he was and is continues to be the only Australian senator that has had the gumption and courage to raise the topic of UAP and ask questions about it in an Australian context, which is disappointing, but also uh, encouraging in the respect that he's asking questions and he's pressing folks in the Australian Department of Defence on this issue. But it's disheartening that his peers have not followed his lead. So that's why one of my efforts is to continue to engage my elected representatives to try and, uh, you know, encourage and, and push them in direction of asking these same sort of questions that Senator Wish Wilson is asking. So on the 27th of October of last year, that's just some background. Um, P Senator Peter Wish Wilson was used his allocated time to ask the then uh, Chief of Air Force, Air, Fo Air Marshal Mel Hupfield, about UAP in an Australian context following the release of ODNI's preliminary assessment. So let me share my screen so okay. your uh, viewers can see this just for context, because it's a really interesting uh, exchange. So I'll just play this on my end. Senator, uh, Air Marshal Mel Hupfield, okay. Chief of Air Force. Uh, I am a pilot and I used to fly aeroplanes, not current now, but I, I think I've got the uh, information you might need depending on your question. Oh, right. Okay. Well, <laughs> great. Um, but my question relates to the uh, – I know we have close, close ties with the US. We, we share intelligence. Um, my questions relate to release of the – uh, report on the 25th of June 2021 by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, preliminary assessments, unidentified aerial phenomena. Um, this is an issue that uh, has been uh, has, has been raised in in Congress. The Department of Defence has submitted a report. Uh, it's become a significant matter of public interest. And I suppose I, I, my first question is: Are you aware of that report? Uh, Chief of Air Force. I'm not um, formally aware of the report, but if I'm thinking there was an uh, article in the newspapers, a commentary about that at some stage. But I'm not quite sure of the, the content of the report. 
Okay. Um, just as a matter of interest, what, what questions did you think I was going to ask? <laughs> I thought you were going to ask some questions about aircraft, but it sounds like you're going to ask questions about UFOs. <laughs> well, we, we could, we'd be very interesting to hear your views on this. Um, look, yes, it has been reported in the media I- extensively, the body language um, both here and in, internationally. So you could see there that Air Marshal Mel Hupfield uh, didn't look so without going into uh, let me just yeah so without going into the rest of the the video um, you can see so Air Marshal Mel Hupfield was caught totally off guard with with that line of questioning and I think he probably felt somewhat thrown under the bus by uh, Maurice Payne who was one of the the senators at that that estimates hearing that um, put him forward uh, on the on the, the the hot seat to answer those questions so essentially um, the Air Marshal Mel Hupfield was asked by Senator Wish Wilson, has the Australian Department of Defence read the preliminary assessment on UAP? And they hadn't. They hadn't even bothered. And this was in October of last year. And as of early this year, they still hadn't read the preliminary assessment. And Senator Wish Wilson had asked questions, well, does uh, the Australian Defence Force, the um, the, the services, have any current reporting or recording protocols uh, on UAP, are there any uh, any similar mechanisms uh, like the UA the then UAP task force? And uh, the question was basically no. Uh, the Australian Department of Defence does not currently have any mechanisms in place to uh, you know, re- report or record on 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 UAP, which is very interesting because the Australian the Royal Australian Air Force has had almost as long as a history at looking at UAP or UFO, what they call um, UAS or have historically called UAS in Australia, unusual aerial sightings. They had a policy uh, that spanned many decades and they actually investigated uh, sightings and, and reports of UAS from the 1950s through to the, the mid-90s until 1996 when they no longer took reports Uh, on UAP and they no longer investigated it. So it really perplexes me as to why all of a sudden there seems to be this, you know, this big push and uh, by by the US, our US ally, to take this topic seriously now, ever since, you know, Nimitz and everything that's happened since then, with all of the reports that are coming out from uh, military aviators and members of the you know, personnel in the military, there seems to be this uh, you know, this this uptick of um, information that's being disseminated ever since 2017, and more and more questions are being asked by U.S. lawmakers on this topic. Yet Australia is dragging their heels; they're just towing the line like they've done since 1996 where they stopped looking into this topic and they just have no desire whatsoever to to um, to, to to revisit it so their position has not changed for a good 25 plus years and and, and I don't understand why so that's been the driving motivation for me to try and get to the bottom through these FOIA requests that I've submitted as to well what do you know about UAP and when did you know it? And why aren't you having discussions about it when our US ally is? So, And that yeah, leads so me to two questions before we get into specifically the, the documents themselves. My first is a quick one. Do you think they're being honest? Personally, I don't think they are. I think they know. I think they're holding a, uh, a lot of cards close to their chest. They, uh, I think they know more than they're, uh, they're revealing. And there's a couple of reasons why I think that. One, the stigma and ridicule that has long plagued this topic, I think, has also long plagued uh, members of the military and, and folks that you know, see something and say something in Australia. So I think at a an elected official level, or if you're in a position of leadership in government, there is this fear of political suicide still on this topic. Uh, and I would say to folks, Australian senators and members of parliament that are concerned that, well, if I talk about this, I'm going to be you know, it's going to um, you know, upset my constituents and it's going to you know, risk me uh, being re-elected. I would say just have a look at Senator Wish Wilson's record. He just got re-elected and he's been asking questions 
uh, about UAP in Australian context quite frequently now. And it was asked after that hearing in in, uh, in October of last year that I reached out to Senator Wish Wilson's office, and I've been um, uh, thankfully in, in regular contact with him, providing him with updates on what I've been discovering through FOIA. So I think political suicide is one aspect of it. I also think that there there is potentially a degree of embarrassment on the uh, on, on the side of the Royal Australian Air Force that. The whole reason why, and if I show a document, uh, I'll just show another document that um, your your audience can um, can look at. I'll just stop this one, share the other. Uh, so this is just for um, for context. So back in 1993, uh, there was a, a briefing paper that was prepared by a, a, a gentleman by the name of Brett Biddington. He prepared a briefing paper for the Chief of Air Force, or back then it was called the Chief of the Air Staff. And in this uh, briefing paper pertaining to unusual aerial sightings policy, there is basically, I'll just scroll down to the uh, the appropriate pages here, suggested policy going forward. So for many years, the Royal Australian Air Force has been formally responsible for handling uh, unusual aerial sightings at the official level. Consideration, though, of the scientific records suggests that whilst not all UAS have a ready explanation, and that's the, the, the bit that really threw me, whilst not all UAS have a ready explanation, there is no compelling reason for the, the RAAF, RAAF to continue to devote resources to recording, investigating, and attempting to explain UAS. The RAAF no longer accepts reports on UAS and no longer uh, attempts assignment of causal allocation of liability. Members of the community are essentially encouraged to reach their local police or law enforcement, as well as any uh, UFO civilian organizations uh, like the likes of MUFON. So back in 1993, they were laying, you know, setting the stage for the Royal Australian Air Force to, to kind of wipe its hands of this topic. Uh, and in 1996, that's exactly what happened. They ceased taking re reports. Uh, they ceased investigating it. And in 2013, the unusual aerial sightings policy that they had was formally terminated. Uh, the just thing a quick, I don't let me, yeah. if I could jump in really quick, just for in the States, our military acronym for UAS is Unmanned Aerial System or, or Aircraft System. But uh, I know you already said it, but can you say again, it, that's not the same no, that's right. For you so guys. UAS, exactly. So UAS now in Australia is more so referred to, you know, the drones. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but but between the 1950s through to the mid 1990s, UFO in Australia was referred to by the Royal Australian Air Forces as UAS, unusual aerial sightings, and it's since now evolved into uh, unidentified aerial phenomena (UAP) and even now uh, unidentified aerospace undersea phenomena, UA, you, you, I keep losing track of all the yeah, acronyms the acronym. these days. Uh, but, that's but, so that's that, frequently discussed on this channel yeah, on how yeah, absolutely yeah, damn confusing oh, all that is. And, and there's something behind that in itself. Uh, there's a strategic decision, I think, why they always use weird acronyms. Uh, so, so that was an important document that came out uh, through, through FOIA, I think, uh, a number of years ago. So fast forward to October of um, last year, and I'll just pull up a, a another document uh, for your viewers to, to see. Uh, here we go here. And thanks for the clarity on the UAS. I've, I just wanted to make it a little less confusing for those going, well, wait a minute, they're talking about drones? Just in case yeah, they missed it. Yeah, it, it, it is confusing. And, and so I, I've, I've refrained, refrained from including the acronym UAS in FOIA requests now because that will capture, obviously, stuff that's drone-related in, in this day and age, but I still refer to unusual aerial sightings. So um, following the and, – and I'll read out some of the key elements here so your audience doesn't, doesn't have to read it – but following the uh, the questions that Senator Wish Wilson asked of Chief of Air Force Air, Air Marshal Mel Hupfield back in October of last year and, – and by the way, we, we haven't played the full exchange. That was just really the front end of it to kind of highlight the – the distaste that the air marshal had for that line of questioning, uh, you can uh, through the, uh, the 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 Australian Parliament's website or even my channel, the Unexplained Rundown. You can watch that exchange in its entirety. Yeah, but and essentially, I will, I will just so the audience knows, I will link to Grant's video 
uh, to his channel with that. You have the full exchange uh, yep. in there, right? So, and that's the link you had sent me. Uh, there's, the there's, there's another link that I'll share with you. Okay. So you yeah. Can, make sure I got it. Yep. Uh, for those that are watching or listening on the audio podcast version, just check the show notes. So on YouTube, you'll find them below in the description. Audio podcast, just go to www.theblackvault.com and you'll see a podcast listing. Find Grant's interview and it'll be in the show notes there. Uh, so we'll get that linked over. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so essentially, Senator Wish Wilson was not satisfied with the responses that Air Marshal Mel Hupfield gave at that Senate estimates hearing. So he submitted some questions to refer to as questions on notice. And so the questions that he posed for the Department of Defense, the Australian Department of Defense, uh, to Air Marshal Mel Hupfield, has the Department of Defense had the opportunity to formally review ODNI's preliminary assessment? And as I had indicated previously, uh, the response was no, they have not. Uh, what guidance, if any, has the department sought on the publication of the report? The Department of Defence has not sought any guidance at all on the on the publication. So they're probably the two uh, key questions at this juncture. So essentially, Australian Department of Defence is saying no, we haven't read ODNI's preliminary assessment. We don't have any interest in it. We're not going to read it anytime soon. And that's what raised alarm bells from me. I was like, well, why wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to know what your US ally and Five Eyes partner and the strongest, most advanced uh, and powerful military in the world, what keeps them up at night? If they're taking this seriously and they were not able to identify 143 out of 144 reports of UAP, that's a success rate of, of less than 1% to identify what they are. Wouldn't that keep you up at night and want to know what your US ally is worried about? And being a Five Eyes partner, um, the Five Eyes is a, is a, uh, a collaboration across uh, a number of countries. They share signals intelligence, so they share data to help identify potential national security threats, essentially to help mitigate uh, you know, potential threats uh, in, in the future, as well as strengthen capabilities and, and mitigate vulnerabilities, essentially. Uh, so that was the document that was uh, released, uh, or the responses to Senator Wish Wilson's questions on notice. Uh, there's a, another key document which I was able to secure through for, and I'll, I'll, I won't show every document that I had prepared for today, but I'll just show you uh, the key. We one. love documents. You, 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 you're in the right place to show documents, <laughs> so no worries. Well, well, so I'll, I'll show this one briefly. So um, once that information came back that you know the Australian Department of Defence has no appetite. Um, to, to investigate this issue and, and has not read ODNI's preliminary assessment. One of the questions that Senator Wish Wilson had asked during the Senate's estimates to Air Marshal Mel Hupfield was, can you check across the other services, Army, Navy, and so on, to see if they currently have any reporting mechanisms in place? And so I submitted a FOIA request uh, on uh, emails and correspondence that helped inform the responses that the Australian Department of Defence provided and public publicised that in the that they published in those responses to Senator Wish Wilson, the, the previous uh, slide that I showed. And credit to the Armed Services, the Australian Department of Defence, they did their due diligence. They, they were actually asking the question: Does Navy, Navy Army have protocols? Uh, historically, have they had any protocols? This question was a, a one that threw me though. Um, if no protocol exists for Navy Army, uh, or if no protocol exists, does Navy Army intend to establish service specific protocols for reporting on UFOs and UAPs? So, and he says, I'm on the fence if we need to ask this one. And this document, this was an email from a, a Gene Elliott, who I've actually gone after his emails in a follow up for your request uh, to see what he has uh, you know, corresponded internally on, on UAP. Uh, so, so that was one that was interesting, but it was good to see that at least the, uh, the Department of Defense had done its due diligence and, uh, and was asking around to see if, uh, if there was any, you know, mechanisms in place across any of the other services. Fast forward again to, uh, a, another document that I secured through FOIA, and I'll provide a bit of, um, context on, on this one. Let me just pull this up for you so it's good to go. I think this is the one. Here we go. 
So um, I had in, when was it? It was um, on the 15th of April um, this year, I submitted a, a FOIA request. Uh, and I'll just um, make sure I've got, I can scroll down for you a bit. Uh, I submitted a FOIA request to capture emails for the newly appointed uh, Defence Space Commander. Her name is Catherine Roberts because there was an article um, on Keith Basterfield. For folks that don't know Keith Basterfield, he's a, uh, an incredible researcher. He's an Australian-based researcher. He'd been doing a lot of work on the UAP UFO topic in Australia for many, many years. And I saw an article on his blog about this newly appointed Defence Space Commander, uh, Catherine Roberts. And in her bio on the uh, on on the uh, Australian Department of Defence's website or the Royal Australian Air Force's website, it, it she comments that she has uh, she's an avid science fiction buff, uh, and I thought, oh well, I wonder what her take is. I wonder what her um, inkling is on on UAP. So I decided to go after her her emails from the twenty seventh of October, which was the date of the Senate estimates hearing, to the date that I submitted the request. And to my absolute surprise and delight, I received uh, a very significant series uh, of documents in response. Now, I think it's significant. A lot of people out there uh, that are well-versed in following UAP in Australian context might think it's a bit of a nothing burger. And that's right. I respect the nothing burger, but I think it was a something burger because what we essentially got back, if I zoom out here, And this document was uh, only recently updated as of the 26th of May of this year. So this was a document, an internal document, uh, a briefing paper for the Chief of Air Force, uh, again, then Air Marshal Mel Hupfield, that was produced after those questions were asked of him at the Senate estimates in October of last year and after the Australian Department of Defence responded to Senator Wish Wilson's questions on notice. There was this briefing paper that was uh, created and shared uh, to Catherine Roberts, the Defence Space Commander, who is um, vice, she's also a vice air marshal. Uh, And the table of contents are quite telling because there is a section designated strategic narrative. And there are also some specific talking points uh, to essentially give the Chief of Air Force and others in positions of leadership in maybe the Royal Australian Air Force, a script uh, to keep them on point if they're asked questions by maybe the press, if they picked up on this topic, which sadly they haven't to date, which is a bit disappointing, uh, or if they're asked any questions from other Australian uh, members of parliament or Australian senators. So if I come down to strategic narrative, and, and this is really what got under my skin, is that this briefing paper, uh, which the background behind the composition of this briefing paper uh, was, if I just come down to the next page, uh, background information pertaining to the strategic narrative was uh, the ODNI's preliminary assessment. So someone in the Department of Defence or the Royal Australian Air Force had read that report uh, and the findings of that report helped inform the commentary in this document. The strategic narrative that the that was being pushed to the chief of air force is UAP, UAP are likely to be one of three things: natural or other benign phenomena. Uh, other benign phenomena. I have no frame of reference as to what that is, so I'm a bit confused on that one. Anomalies with sensors or to technologies that are human made. There is absolutely no reference there to a potential catch-all other bin that the ODNI documented or the the, the, the UAP task force uh, was not able to identify 143 of 144 sightings or reports. So I'm thinking, well, how can how can the Australian Department of Defence or the Royal Australian Air Force make a determination as to what UAP are likely to be or not likely to be if they haven't even read or been privy to the classified data that's documented in the classified version of ODNI's preliminary assessment. How can they make that determination? And But they can't. They can't make that determination because they haven't seen any of the data that the US is looking at and US lawmakers are looking at behind closed doors that's really got them concerned and asking questions. So this really uh really raised some questions for me they this 
strategic narrative has to come from the opinion of the author of this document. It's an uninformed opinion that is potentially informing policy or the position of the Royal Australian Air Force, the Australian Department of Defence going forward, which is completely, in my opinion, the wrong approach to take. If you're going to make a determination on strategic and strategic narrative is basically, well, this is the story that we want to tell and this is what we want our allies and folks that maybe aren't our allies to, this is the line of, of, of talk that we want to take and for them to believe. So that was the strategic narrative that they came up with, which I, I question because they haven't even been privy to any of the, uh, the, the classified data in the ODNI's preliminary assessment. They went on to kind of your background information was, okay, the ODNI's preliminary assessment does not draw any conclusions on what UAP are and most ex remain unexplained. Well, that alone should be reason a compelling enough reason for you to actually jump into the game and say, okay, well, if our US ally is unable to identify a lot of these things and they potentially could be foreign adversarial, as they've indicated, uh, you know, in the strategic narrative. And, uh, and, and if I can just jump in really quick, that second line there, or the sec on the second line, but same sentence on what you just read was mainly due to not enough data or insufficient data. If you scroll to page three. Yeah. Um, and the only reason that stuck out to me is that wasn't necessarily the case, unless I'm forgetting about language. I did a big video on this, and 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 honestly, they they picked the 144 that they picked had had some of the most best data uh, available. Um, so that that's interesting that they have that line in there. That just I'm sorry to jump on you there, but it it stuck out to me, and I wanted to point that out because during Project Blue Book in the 40s, 50s, and, and 60s. Uh, throughout those, that's what they blamed, insufficient mm. data. But a lot of cases that they couldn't identify had both visual observations and instrumentation to back it up. So you can't just say there's lack of data there. Uh, no. and, and on the contrary, there was a lot of data and they could not identify it. So anyway, it seems like they, uh, you're absolutely right. This is based on kind of nothing in somebody's opinion uh, because that, I, I unless I'm just forgetting a line in that report, but – that's that's not true. It, it, the, essentially, the report was screaming, we need more data. We need to be looking at more. Uh, we need to be analyzing more data, more sensor data, more visual data, more radar data, more. You know, we need more to make a, a better informed conclusion as to what UAP could potentially, could potentially be. This is what threw me in this briefing paper. The report, so they're referring to ODI's preliminary assessment, finds no evidence that UAP are extraterrestrial in origin. ODNI's preliminary assessment made absolutely no reference to extraterrestrial. Now, it didn't say that it was. It didn't say that it wasn't. It actually didn't refer to it whatsoever. So why, in my opinion, why the mischaracterization to a degree of ODNI's preliminary assessment and the need to include this line in background information that supports the strategic narrative? It's because I suspect that the Royal Australian Air Force has ref has uh, referred to extraterrestrial in a lot of its materials prior. That document, that UAS uh, policy, that that CAS brief document, extra the word extraterrestrial is referred to, I think, on a number of occasions in that document. So they have actually referenced it in documentation in the past, but they, for some reason, they felt the need to include it. Uh, in this particular briefing paper now, and then it goes goes on to, you know, uh, report some of the cite some of the citing uh, the the cite some of the findings of ODNI's preliminary assessment uh, that UAP reportedly appeared to ex uh, exhibit unusual flight characteristics uh, that it could potentially be sensor error, but again, we need more data to help identify uh, what UAP could be. UAP clearly pose uh, a safety of flight issue. So we know that the U.S. is looking at it because there are potential national security threats and safety of flight issues for military aviators. Uh, they felt the need to highlight here that if civilians wish to report UAP, they should contact their local police authorities or get in contact with a civilian research organization like uh, MUFON. Uh, they reiterated their position that the defense uh, canceled its instruction pertaining to, you know, UAS, what it does about uh, reports received and so on. It cancelled uh, that instruction in 2000. The actual policy was formally cancelled in 2013. 
Uh, you, this is to your point before, John, UAP also referred to as unidentified flying objects or an unusual aerial sightings. But then it gets really interesting, talking points. So this is, I believe, designed to keep members of the Royal Australian Air Force leadership uh, on track, on message, if they're asked questions by the Australian media or uh, Australian senators or, or members of parliament. How are UAP reported defence? Defence does not have a policy. Well, we already know that. Re historically, RAAF uh, was responsible for handling reports but ceased uh, taking them in 1996. After again determining that there was no scientific or other compelling reason to devote resources to the recording and investigation of UAP. Again, wouldn't the compelling reason be that our US ally has not been able to identify 143 of 144 cases of UAP? Defense safety of flight incidents, uh, including those potentially posed by UAP, are handled by the Defense Aviation Safety Authority, known as DASA. I went after um, incident reports or what they call occurrence reports by DASA for 10 years. They knocked me back on 10, uh, so I compromised to five, and there haven't been any uh, reports of UAP and any occurrence reports for the last five years. Senator Wish Wilson took that one step further and wanted to say, well, has there any been anything reported in the last 10 years? And they said no. And then he went back and said, well, has there any been, been anything in the last 20 years? And they also said no. But he was he was he was basing his request on a search for unidentified aircraft rather than UAP. So I suspect, uh, or UAS. So I suspect that may not have uh, produced any fruit on that front. Could they have just done unidentified? I mean, does it work? That it, w it would have made sense to maybe just to, to try and capture all information via identified. And I've included the the keyword unidentified in, in a lot of my um, my uh, my FOIA requests f following on from 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 that specifically. Yeah. So there might be opportunities. So you still have open cases for that? I do. Yeah, I've got I've got quite a few open ones. Yeah. Just do a s keyword search for unusual. <laughs> and see what happens. Yeah, yeah um, and and that's and that's as you've commented a couple of times. What's challenging is because the acronyms and terminology is always changing. Uh, you always have to adjust your FOIA request to try and capture, you know, w what you think is going to bear some fruit. And and like you've said in the past, you don't want to be too specific with a FOIA request. You don't want to be too vague. You got to kind of find yeah. the Goldilocks zone to try and uh, to try and get some 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 information. Uh, it, I'm, it's, I'm a, it's a lesson I learn over and over and over. But but I was only half being facetious there when I said, you know, just doing a request for unusual or just unidentified, because you were saying that the senator had them do a, a search. And I'm sorry, for the aircraft. You right. Yeah. So that particular phrasing may not appear that way. But if unidentified does or, or something similar, they just won't do it. And and I just had that incident uh, happen to me a couple weeks ago right. with a FOIA request. So yeah, the, the least amount of description you can give the better. And yeah. I've gotten to the point of, uh, for example, just for the, the FOIA listeners out there, I always try and throw in two cents on, on doing keyword searches. But I used to do like OSAP, for example, Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Applications Program, uh, just do Advanced Aerospace. And cut out the whole thing because the acronyms are so darn difficult to remember that they're likely misrepresented in documents anyway. But generally, when you do those types of just two words versus five, you have a much, much better, uh, you know, better method to, uh, to, to get responsive records. So yeah, if they accept the request, I would highly recommend to do just some of those keywords and see if they kick it back on you. Absolutely. And, and these are the sorts of things I'm learning, uh, as I go along the road. I mean, I've, I've learned a, a hell of a lot from, from you and, and the, you know, the live streams and the recorded, uh, videos that you put out and a lot of the articles that you publish and, and just, uh, the Black Vault itself is a great resource. I mean, I've, one of the, um, one of the other topics I'm fascinated by is the Phoenix Lights, which we can talk about in just a moment. But I've actually looked at some of the FOIA documents that you've secured historically, mm -hmm. uh, back in 97, 90, 97, I think, um, you know, after the Phoenix Lights. So, uh, you know, that's where I'm still being a, 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 a massive sponge on this topic and being a student of FOIA and, and, and learning from, uh, from you and, and your real, 
you know leadership on on foyer that you've um that, that you've been involved with for, for a number of decades now. So. I appreciate that. I'm 26 years in and I'm still learning. There, there's no, I don't think there's any such thing as a FOIA expert anymore. It, uh, there's, there's no, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a destination. It's a journey, isn't it? So that's you, right. You, you and I don't think the journey will ever end. I love the journey though, but yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah. definitely a learning experience. And look, I, I would say to any folks out there that are, uh, that are like me are very curious on this topic, but are also a concerned citizen and, and want truth and transparency from those that we elect into positions of authority, um, submit a FOIA request if you've got a question. FOIA is much scarier than it actually is. I think that the thought of submitting a FOIA request is quite daunting for a lot of folks. It certainly was for me before I submitted my first FOIA request. But if you know what you're wanting to ask and you can frame it in a certain way that uh, you, you know, you're not being overly specific or overly vague. You, you're, you're quite direct on what you're after. Then, you know, I've I, what I've um, been really surprised by, and and also kind of, um, uh, you know, um, thankful that some there are folks out there that have now started to that have been following, obviously the the posts that I've been putting out there in the videos on my channel that have reached out to me privately to uh, ask me questions or, or say that they um, would be interested on collaborating on a FOIA request if they don't feel confident to submit one themselves. So uh, I'm really uh, kind of taken aback that, you know, there are folks that are taking notice of uh, just the, the work that I've been doing purely from a curiosity standpoint and the fact that I have a right to this information as an Australian taxpayer. So uh, I'm, I'm asking these questions, but I wouldn't have asked those questions if it wasn't for the work of you and, you know, Luis Jimenez and the big phone home and those sorts of things. So again, that's why I come back and say, you know, thank you for inspiring me and motivating me to, to, to get into the game. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm cognizant of your audience's time, but I just want to skip through to, uh, the, really the last through couple of uh, talking points, mm -hmm. uh, with the U.S. calling UAP, uh, a potential threat to national security, should Australia be concerned? Again, they reiterate that UAP are likely to be one of three things. Well, again, how can they determine what it's likely to be or not likely to be if they are <laughs> if they haven't seen any of the classified data in their OD9? Or they're program. not doing anything themselves for 25 well, years. Well, they haven't or well, they haven't looked at this topic since 1996. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you've, there's a ton of ton of historical data in uh, the, the National Archives of Australia. You know, they released a lot of their their reports, case files and so on that are uh, readily accessible and publicly available in National Archives. But they haven't been looking at any data since 1996 and they haven't even looked at any of the data that uh, our US allies collected. And only last week, uh, a bit over a week ago, the, the new Australian Minister for Defence, he's also the Deputy Prime Minister, Richard Miles, um, had a meeting at the Pentagon with uh, the, the Secretary of Defence, Lloyd, Lloyd Austin, Austin. And I can bet my bottom dollar that there would have been something tabled for discussion uh, around this topic. So I've the day of their meeting, which was the 14th, your 13th of July, 14th of July for me, I went after, uh, I submitted a FOIA request for correspondence, meeting schedules, uh, meeting agendas, talking points to see if, well, is the Australian Minister for Defence, the US Secretary of Defence's counterpart, at least uh, taking notice of the serious interest that the US has on this topic? And are they at least... Uh, you know, trying to find out a little bit more for themselves so that they don't get caught red faced. This is the other issue I have. And I know I'm darting back a, back, a bit back and forth here. But that's okay. So the National Defense Authorization Act that Biden signed into law of December of last year, one, there is a single clause in that legislation that mandates that the new office dedicated to investigating UAP has to coordinate with allies and partners of the United States to better understand the extent and nature of the phenomena of UAP. So Australia being a Five Eyes partner and a strong ally of the US, the US, the office, the, the now new Arrow office is obviously in due course. It's obviously got a six year, uh, six year mission. It's going to reach out to its allies at some point and ask questions about, well, can you help us with this UAP issue? Because we're having a real time trying to identify it back home. And we know the US 
is going to say, we know that you've looked into this topic in the past because you had a policy from the 50s through the mid-90s, and there have been numerous reports that are well documented in the the National Archives of Australia that there were reports of anomalous crafts and objects sighted at military military installation bases in Australia. Uh, Harold E. Holt base on, um, uh, on in Western Australia that was that is well referenced in uh, Ross Coulthard's book In Plain Sight. You've got the Woomera uh, weapons range in South Australia, which um, interesting fact, my uncle, my mother's brother, who's since passed away. He was the project manager of uh, a top secret project called Resat, which was responsible for launching Australia's very first satellite uh, back in 1967. And there were a number of sightings reported uh, at that weapons range, that military base, over a, over a decade. And so much so that there was even a civilian UFO group that was created in the region to investigate those those oh, those wow. sightings. You've also got uh, bases like Pine Gap in the mm -hmm. Northern Territory, which is a joint operated US-Australia joint operated base where there have been sightings reported as well. And, and again, Ross documents a lot of these uh, in his book. So if the US is going to come knocking on our door and say, we know that you, there have been sightings uh, you know, over our joint military, military installation Pine Gap, can you help us identify or provide some more data on what UAP are. And if they come back to the US and say, oh, um, yeah, sorry, folks, we haven't been looking at this issue since 1996, nor have we bothered to even inquire as to uh, can we be privy to some of the classified information, the classified version of the ODI's preliminary assessment, they're going to be completely red-faced and they're going to have nothing to contribute to the, the conversation and they're going to be uh, completely embarrassed and in the eyes of public perception. I think that's one of the big fears that the Australian Department of Defence has in the Royal Australian Air Force. There's this public perception that if we tell the public that we're going to start looking at UAP again, we're admitting that we don't have control, we don't have air dominance, we don't have control of our skies, and we're admitting the fact that, you know, well, we, we don't really have the control that we uh, we we perceive that we have and we want the public to have this degree of trust that we we know what's going on and flying around in our skies so that's the other element that i fear is part of it as well that's that's um, that's uh, and that is uh, something that i've bantered about for a long time here in america is that national security concern of telling the people we are not in control and to my surprise, they're they're actually doing that now. Uh, yep. And I only laugh about it because for so long I thought they'll they'll never admit it. And then here they are. And you're right. I mean, there there is that element of uh oh, we are not in control, and we have to tell our people we're not in control. Um, but I am surprised that they haven't followed the lead and and done it themselves. Uh, so that's that's just surprising yeah. to me. I'm wondering if that will shift in the next coming months or years well i hope so because this this talking point is the one that really concerns me as an ally have the united states offered to or asked to collaborate on uap investigations no the united states nor any other nation or ally have requested or offered to collaborate on uap reporting or investigation this is the real kick in the guts for me defense has no desire to se to seek collaboration on this issue uh, and there was a document that I only just received from the Royal Australian Air Force. This is the last one I'll show for your uh, for your audience here. Uh, just make sure I bring the right, right one up. Uh, so I had reached out to the the new Minister Defence Minister for De Defence Richard Miles uh, throughout the month of June repeatedly, um, asking him the question. Well, you know, our US ally and Five Eyes partner is taking UAP very seriously. Why isn't the Australian Department of Defence? And I've tried to engage him frequently in a respectful manner via email and, and on Twitter. And I received a response uh, back on the 7th of July from an, an RJ Denny, who's the Air Vice Marshal of Head of Air Force Capability, saying, I don't know if I can highlight it, but um, saying Defence obviously does not have a protocol for the reporting and recording of UAP and UFO sightings. At this point in time, and this is a neutral letter, obviously, but I do take some comfort knowing that this is at this point in time, defense will not be pursuing research into this matter. That's obviously disappointing, but 
that gives us some hope that maybe there is an opportunity for them to review their position down the road. Uh, I understand that the United States Congress uh, recently held a hearing on UAP and UFO. So they're well and truly aware of the fact that the, the, the US is looking at it, but they're just considering it a matter uh, of, a, of a foreign government. So they're not wanting to touch this topic. And that's the big question I have is why? Why don't you want to touch this topic and ask questions because our US ally is? And, and that's why I would really love for members of the Australian media to exercise their journalistic due diligence and ask this question of the Australian Department of Defence. Well, why aren't you looking into the issue? Why aren't you taking it seriously when our US ally is? In the States, especially prior to the conversation from the Department of Defense kind of exploding where they've got offices and they're talking about it and, and being more open. Prior to that, military personnel, not a ton, but military personnel were getting the the mainstream attention. New York Times ran some stories. So military personnel were coming forward. Is that going on in Australia? Is the is the government and military ignoring men and women coming forward and saying, hey, look, I was flying here on, you know, this aircraft and I saw something. Is that going on there as well? So I, I have anecdotal evidence to support that, that I think, and the Pentagon, to their credit, has now stated that they make, they're, they're taking a concerted effort to try and address the stigma and ridicule that's long plagued this topic so that they there are a, a sensible see something say something reporting mechanisms that are available to military aviators and personnel i think the fact that there is a lack of those same reporting mechanisms in australia is why people aren't talking about it and again anecdotally there are folks that are members of the the australian defense force that have seen something and they're either reporting it to the likes of mufon because they're the ones that you know defense is saying well we don't look at it but you know have a chat with your police enforcement i don't know what law enforcement is going to do about it other than take a police statement from you uh but have a chat with your local ufo civilian or, or organization and they'll take the report uh and and ross himself has documented in play in his book in plain sight and said uh, on numerous occasions that he's having ongoing conversations with current and former members of the australian defense force that are seeing anomalous objects, but they're not saying anything about it because one, either their fear of being ridiculed, their fear of the, there's, there's fear of the stigma or fear of reprisals that they may be jeopardizing their their position, or maybe they have some form of security classification or non-disclosure agreement and they can't talk about it. So, so anecdotally, there are a lot of reports coming in from people that don't want to go on the record saying, I've seen something, but I don't want to really say something by going on the record because I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to be made fun of. I don't want to be ridiculed. So Australia, unfortunately, is probably a good decade or two behind the US on this effort. Where we are now is where you guys have come from. And I only hope that Australia follows the US's lead and eventually falls into line uh, and talks about this topic. And I think I think there is a changing of the guard potentially around the corner because only um, in the last three days in Australia, in Sydney, the, there was a, an event, the inaugural, it's called the inaugural Australian Defence Science Technology and Research Summit that was hosted in Sydney as a, as a hybrid event, some in, some in person, some virtually. And uh, the, the whole theme of the summit was around resilience, the ability and capacity for human technical systems to quickly adapt and recover from unexpected interference, disruption, adversity, threats, and other stressors, stressors to prevail, whether they be intentionally enacted by an adversary or occur naturally as a consequence of changing conditions. So the fact that there is a summit and a, an Australian uh, defense science technology summit and research summit that's taking place right now and there are questions being asked of folks that are thought leaders and folks in positions of leadership at that conference i won't i won't say who but there are folks that are um uh, are well known in this community in australia that attended that conference virtually that were asking the questions that i'm asking why is Australia not taking this subject seriously when our US ally is? 
and they've mandated that they look into this topic by legislation, the, the National Defense Authorization Act, and hopefully now the Intelligence Authorization Act when that gets passed. So I do think that there is going to be a changing tide uh, in due course. It's just a matter of time. The next Senate estimates meeting that's scheduled for Australia, I think, is in November of this year. So I suspect that Senator Wish Wilson is going to have a ton more questions to ask uh, at that hearing. And hopefully at that point, uh, there are a lot more other senators that are following his lead and also asking the same sort of questions. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to share those documents. And uh, I, I'd love to share all of them if you're okay with that uh, with the audience. And, and I'll put it if you're okay with that, we'll put a link into the show notes below. Uh, of course, full credit to Grant for getting those documents. And hopefully you'll, you'll keep me updated. I mean, we talk from time to time anyway, but I'd love to bring you back on the show the next time you get more documents or that hearing happens. Hopefully you'll come back and, and share it with us because as I said in the beginning of the show, I'm so ignorant about other countries. My whole focus when it comes to the UAP issue has always been the American government. And uh, it's not out of lack of interest, but rather it is so complicated to to try and unravel that mystery with the American government. Oh, God, to tackle another government, it just uh, makes my head <laughs> explode. So I kind of put up a wall mentally, but again, not because of lack of interest. So I can't thank you enough for for, for joining me today. You, you, the, the, the pleasure is absolutely all mine. I really appreciate you you uh, taking an interest uh, in what is happening down under and, and inviting me to have a chat with you and your audience. And, um, you know, I, I, again, really applaud all of the good work that you do and, and you know, at the forefront leading this effort. Uh, I'm learning from you and others. So, so continue to do the great the work that you do. It is, you, you offer a true valuable service to this community. So, so thank you for you. And I do think that, you know, uh, it's not just the US that's taking this topic seriously now. You've also got Canada, another Five Eyes partner. You've got Brazil has recently held a hearing, a five and a half hour hearing on on this very topic. So it, this is not an issue that's isolated to just the United States. It's affecting other countries around the world. And hopefully uh, the Australian government gets off its ass and, and takes it seriously, along with the Australian media. So whenever there are updates to share, I'll be sure to, uh, to, to check in with you and, and provide you with, uh, with any developments. Well, I appreciate that and the kind words, and you're welcome whenever you want. Just uh, uh, give me a buzz, and, and you are more than welcome to come well, on. The, Last, Sorry, go ahead. I, I was there. Next time I'm in L.A., I know I was there a couple months back. I'll, I, I promise I'll make I the effort. To, uh, I was totally bummed when I saw that. <laughs> well, um, well, well, not I, back I almost me. blocked you on Twitter. I was like, forget <laughs> it. You won't have lunch with me? No. I, I had I, one day in L.A., and uh, I thought, man, I just no, can't. No, no. With the, with the 405, the way it is, the traffic, I would have taken that's a about day. A day drive so yeah, yeah exactly, i totally get yeah. it um <laughs> last question i have for you is throw out i know you're you're active on twitter which is where i communicate with you a lot uh how do people contact you if you have a website your youtube channel uh, i'll make sure that i link it in the show notes below but for the audio version if they want to find you on twitter and websites and stuff how do they do it yeah, so you, uh, you can find me on Twitter just at my handle at Grant Levac. Uh, I'm on YouTube as well. Uh, just search for Grant Levac on YouTube. Uh, I have a channel uh, called the, the Unexplained Rundown where I tackle these kind of questions. What is Australia doing about UAPs? Um, I'm actually just about to release a brand new video. Uh, it's a bit of a, a passion project. Uh, a, a deep dive exploration of uh, Kurt Russell's experience of the Phoenix Lights, which I have to also again thank to you, John, for that one because you had a couple months ago, you know, recognizing the 25th anniversary of this, the the Phoenix Lights. You had Dr. Lynn Kitai mm -hmm. on your show, and and I listened to that show, and that actually inspired me to uh, research the Phoenix Lights, in particular Kurt Russell's account, and. I've been very fortunate enough after months of research that I've actually been able to uncover some some new information pertaining really? to his his uh, his encounters. So I won't give it away. It's nothing uh, earth shattering, but it certainly was intriguing to me being a Kurt Russell fanatic and a, and a fan of the UAP and UFO topic. So uh, yeah, jump on over to my YouTube channel. That's uh, that's going to be dropped in the coming weeks. Very cool. Well, I'll make sure that I tweet that out for you as well. But keep me updated when that video drops. And Grant, thank you so much again. I truly appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Thanks, John. Enjoy your weekend. Thank, 
Thank you. And thank you all for listening and watching. If you can on YouTube, thumbs up button really helps a lot. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. If you're watching on the, uh, or excuse me, you're listening on the audio podcast version, or if you don't know that I have one, it is listed on every pro- podcast platform under the Black Vault Radio. If you can consider writing a review, I shoot for five stars. That would be a huge help. But again, thank you for listening and or watching. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.